down here. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Friday night instructor presentations. If this is your first time joining us, here's how it works. Um, our visiting instructors are going to take turns giving 10 minute presentations about their work and themselves. It's a really fun night and we're glad you're here for it. Let's get started. Um, our first instructor this evening is Matt Kenny from the Woodworking Studio and our assistant introducing them is Kat Nash and let's give them a warm welcome. Hello guys, I'm Kat Nash and I will be introducing Matt Kenny. Matt Kenny is a professional box and furniture maker living in Northwest Connecticut. He, um, uh, <laughs> Matt teaches woodworking around the world, writes about crafts and hosts the Matt and Joe Woodworking Fun Hour. In his spare time, he draws robot illustrations. Uh, welcome to the stage, Matt Kenny. <laughs> All right, well, I've done a lot of these, but I've never done one outside. Uh, it appears Valley anyways. All right, go back to the start. All right, so I'll just uh, run through some stuff that I make and talk about why I make furniture. And um, yeah, I'll try to take less than 10 minutes so you can all go come and go to sleep, right? That's what you wanna do. Uh, so this is some stuff I've made. Uh, this is all in my house actually well except for that tea cabinet but um so it's a, a cupboard based on a shaker design that was originally made in connecticut not far from my house this we're making a version of this wall cabinet actually this week in class um out in the wood shop so if you'd like to see a ver one another i have multiples of those but i have one here if you'd like to see it in person or if you'd like to see what the students are making you know come by tomorrow night or sometime uh during the day um uh, so the thing that i focus on the most when i'm designing and making things is uh simplicity and the way i go about that is by stripping away ornamentation so if you are familiar with say older furniture from like the colonial times or federal period. And they're fairly ornate with uh, moldings and inlays and things like that, which are all things uh, because I was born in the seventies in Florida, I find repulsive. So uh, I don't use that stuff. Um, what I do like is shaker furniture and mid-century modern furniture, uh, Scandinavian furniture uh japanese design and all of that there's an emphasis on uh proportions and shapes and clean lines and those have all been big influences on my own work so i one of the goals one of the things i, I find interesting is to try to design using as few elements as i can and i think that if you can take just one or two or three things and make something beautiful then it's genuinely beautiful. Uh, there's no hiding behind anything, right? It's just very few things. Um, so what I focus on the most in my work are proportions and patterns and colors. Uh, proportions are the, uh, the bone structure of furniture. And if you get the proportions right, then the furniture most likely will sing beautifully. But if you get it wrong, there's just no chance. It's not really gonna be a successful piece of furniture. Um, one of the things, so like I said, uh, I focus a lot on so pattern, proportions and color. Color came into my work because uh, of the shakers. There's a place in Matt, Western Mass called Hancock Shaker Village and I've been there a lot. And they have a room in the dwelling house that they, did uh, research on the paint, all the different paint layers. And they got back to the original paint and they broke it down chemically and they reconstructed the paints. And you think, the I don't know if you know anything about the Shakers, but they were a religious sect. Uh, they lived in uh, sort of socialist communities and they kept the sisters and the brothers, the men and the women separate. They were celibate, which is why there aren't any more Shakers um and they seemed like very stark people but in fact they celebrated color and they were always technologically advanced it was a shaker sister that introduced the circular saw to the united states and it was also a shaker i think it was a shaker brother 
you know how you have, when you're a kid at school or you're in a cafeteria and your chair can lean back and the foot stays on it because it pivots? That was a shaker that invented that. It made, they made it out of wood. Uh, but anyway, so I saw this really vibrant color in the dwelling house and it was all sort of milk paint based. So I started to use milk paint in my work. Uh, there's also a round barn there. So when I wanted to make shaker boxes, instead of making them oval, I made them round like the barn. Uh, so color has always been really important to me. Um, and uh, patterns are really important to me. And uh, so one of the ways I create patterns in my work, this is something the shakers did really well, is by taking the parts of the piece and even the structure of the piece and using it to create uh, geometry. So here, the door and the drawers are used to create something of a pattern or an array of shapes. And uh, that can be like emphasized by the use of woods that are different colors or by differing the thickness of the various parts to emphasize the structural hierarchy of the piece. So the outer case is the most important thing. So it's the thickest. And then the parts get thinner as you move further into the piece. Uh, but I'm always uh, looking at the, what I make and thinking about what space of it is going to be seen the most. And that's the one where I, I work the hardest to create something that's visually interesting. So this is a, a tea cabinet I made when I, I once made 52 boxes in a, in a year. And this is one of the ones that I made. Uh, this is also one that I made during that time. And again, it's the use of clean lines, uh, color. Here you see some green fabric uh, and the pale colored wood is basswood. Um, and by separating the case into three separate sections, I can introduce some, uh, some shape and pattern that are geometry that normally wouldn't be there if it was just a single rectangular case. So I, uh, that's one of the ways I go about doing that. Um, and actually this is another box from that 52 boxes thing. Uh, and here I always had a fascination with bento boxes, which are you know, lots of little compartments. And so I make boxes that have multiple compartments in them and use that as an opportunity to break up the lid and uh, create some type of uh, pattern uh, alongside it. Um, this box is also a good illustration of how I use wood grain to emphasize the shapes of the uh, parts of the furniture that I make. So it's nice straight grain, which uh, complements the rectangular or square shape of the lids. Um, and I'm a big fan of fabric. I use a lot of fabric in my work. So you can see some here in the bottom of the box. Uh, so I do make a lot of boxes. Uh, my first book was about boxes. And actually, my third book is about boxes as well. It comes out later this year. Um, my second book was about something called kumiko, which is a Japanese uh, decorative art that's been around for over a thousand years. And this is an example of kumiko. Um, and I love it because it's patterns. And uh, it's just something that's simple and beautiful. So I really enjoy making a lot of Kumiko. And uh, like I said, my second book was about Kumiko and I travel around teaching it as well. It's a lot of fun. Um, so that was a, a panel that I made. This is another one uh, that I made. In Japan, traditionally they were used in shoji screens and also above doors and what are called Rama are what we call transom lights. So they were used there. They were used uh, in windows and doors. Uh, and now they're used in all those places, but they're also used to create like large murals for walls. And the different patterns are used along with different colors of wood to create like amazing scenes of Mount Fuji or, you know, bucolic mountainscapes. It's pretty amazing uh, what is done there with Kumiko. So uh, that's another one that I made and here's one. Um, so there wasn't, uh, later there'll be some cabinetry, but uh, two of the big things that I, you know, the primarily what I make are 
like tea cabinets and boxes and Kumiko panels, um, which I use Kumiko not just as like wall art or decorative art, but also I incorporate it into my furniture. So in a door of a cabinet or something like that. Um, a little bit about how I design. Um, I took three years of drafting in high school back. I did learn on CAD, but it had only just come out. So uh, we did all pencil and paper drafting and I still think that way. So I always design in two dimensions. And for me, I look at whatever face of the piece you're gonna see the most. So if it's a box sitting on a table, it's the top. If it's a chest of drawers, it's the front of the chest of drawers because that's what you're gonna see when you walk into the room. And in my work, you know, through pattern and proportion and color, I try to make a, like a bold geographic uh, graphical statement. I'm really fascinated by like mid-century graphic design, which is really just like colors and bold lines and that's it. But they have this really amazing, beautiful impact. And like this drawing, which you might think is like a simplified, oversimplified version of something really isn't. If you go back, if I show you that cabinet again, it's basically a perfect representation of that cabinet. So the idea is just to keep things really simple, uh, but in some way try to be bold. Uh, so like I said, I start with the face that's seen first and I just sketch out lots and lots and lots of variations on that. Growing up, I never thought I was creative. I still don't really consider myself a creative person um, and definitely not an artist, but I was working with this furniture maker once and I asked him how he was able to come up with all these things. He said, well, all I do is just say, what's one thing that I could change? And then that sort of clicked for me uh, in my brain. So now it's, I can sit down and draw like four pages of one box variations on that because each time you just have to change one thing and that's really not that hard, is it? You know, I thought creativity just kind of like popped into your head out of nowhere. And that's not the way it works. Although I shouldn't be saying that because I'm not creative, right? I don't, what do I know? <laughs> I'm just some guy in a wood shop. Um, so I draw out lots of variations on something. I whittle it down and I draw them more carefully, making notes about construction or about materials and joinery. Uh, and then I whittle it down even more and draw those even more carefully. And then finally, I'll pick the version that I'm going to make and I'll draw that on graph paper. And here I'm focusing on proportions and not measurements or dimensions. So once I've got the proportions where I want them, then I figure out what each unit of the graph paper is worth. You know, is it two inches, is it one inch, whatever. Um, and I chose, you know, this cabinet, which I did have a lot of uh, drawings for it and uh, the whole process for it because this is a cabinet I made from a six by six or an eight by eight piece of oak that was sitting in front of the wood shop at Peters Valley for years. And they asked me to make something for a show where everything was supposed to be inspired by Peters Valley. And I said, well, can I take that piece of wood? And they said, yeah. So I kind of knew what dimensions, you know, what I could get from it. And this is the cabinet I made, uh, which has Kumiko in it and has a type of paper called Chiyogami paper behind the Kumigo. Um, so this was all, all the red oak came from uh, somewhere here in the, in the valley. So um, the, so, like I said, I don't really consider myself a creative person, but I do have been fortunate enough to somehow uh, get to the point where the things that I make, and I'm gonna sound like, a, this is being broadcast over the internet, then I can cuss, right? I'm gonna sound like an arrogant asshole, but the stuff that I've made, I've gone to the point where the stuff that I make is recognizable as mine. And so people ask me, how do I get to where you are? And I tell them you make a lot of dumb mistakes. <laughs> you get a PhD in philosophy and then you work at a magazine that's unrelated to that. But um, I thought about it a lot. 
And uh, I kind of realized that the stuff that I make is a distillation of the things that I find interesting in the world. So what I, what I try to, what I tell people is that if you stop and think about what you find interesting in the world, and it might be you find shadows and light interesting, or you find color interesting, or you find you know the shape of rocks interesting, whatever it is, if you think about that, and you can figure out a way to put it into your work, then you'll soon be creating things that uh, express your unique voice because we all see the world differently from one another. No two of us see it the same way. And that there's a lot of explanation for it. Right? I grew up in Florida in the 70s uh, and then I went and got a you know, philosophy degree and all these things and your story is completely different from mine and it, shades the way that you see and perceive the world so if you can like key into that you can uh find your own creative voice uh one of the things that i do find interesting is light and shadow uh when i worked at fine woodworking this magazine you know i was a photographer for a long time and i still am and photography is all about it's just light understanding light and uh how light can be used to create dimensionality and shape. And so I do a lot of black and white photography and that's how that gets translated into using uh, the, the structure of a piece by offsetting different parts to create dimensionality, to create light and shadow and to create depth. And that really came out of my love of black and white photography. Uh, but I also like color photography and a lot of the things that I stop to see in the world are not, it's not so much about say this tree alongside this road, which is, this was a commute when I, a rental house I had a few years ago, uh, this was the commute to and from work. But this for me is about the deep purple of the thundercloud and the very vibrant spring greens that you see. So when I look out in the world, what I, get focused on a lot are the colors that I see and not necessarily like the shape of the color or something. It's just that there's this beautiful interplay of colors. Uh, so I see a lot of that. Where I live, there's a lot of great winter colors. So um, that's also something those tones show up in my work a lot, just like greens and blues do. Uh, you know, I, I find a lot of inspiration from the winter colors in Connecticut. And then uh, lastly, so why do I make furniture, right? I could have stayed a philosophy professor. I could have tried to be an architect, which is what I wanted to do when I left high school. Um, I could have done a lot of things. Uh, I'm glad that I did find furniture making because when I did, all of everything fell in place. And I don't know what y'all were like when you were young. Some of you are still young. But when I was young, I was like, a tornado contained in a paper bag. And I was always just looking for the next way to go crazy and not in a good way, right? Um, and then when I found furniture making, all of that just calmed down. And I realized that what I needed was an ex a way to express or channel that energy. And uh, I had this boss at the magazine who would make fun of me for making boxes because he said boxes didn't have any function. And he said, the only function of a box is to put pot in. And which I don't smoke pot. So I thought that was a stupid thing to say. Um, so what, I, and it annoyed me that he would say this. So uh, I thought about it more and more. And I remembered back to my philosophy days in Aristotle. And Aristotle talks about four different ways to explain things. I don't mean to offend the pot smokers in the crowd. I, I think I might have. There's some definitely people like, oh, I can't believe he said that about marijuana. <laughs> but um, Aristotle says there's four ways to explain why something is what it is. And one of them is its purpose or its end. And I realized that furniture, there's more to furniture than utility. Just like there's more to ceramics than utility they have meaning in our life beyond that very limited purpose or utility. 
And so, and I told my boss, like he, they asked, he was like, what's the purpose of that? Or the, and I'd say to be beautiful, which he didn't understand, which I loved. So, uh, but um, things have meaning beyond the utility. If you think about the furniture in your home, if you're lucky, maybe you have something that belonged to your parents. And if you're lucky even more, that belonged to one of their parents. And the furniture that we have, we interact with it every day. And it becomes part of our lives. And I had a dining table and my kids were denting it with forks and spoons every day. And that table told a story. And it told a story about the growth of my children from infants to uh, teenagers. And so I make things because I want to have things create something that then someone else takes away and gives it significance and meaning and purpose. Because really the story of a piece of furniture isn't over when I'm done making it. In fact, that story hasn't really even begun yet. Its life really begins when it leaves my shop and goes into somebody's home and they begin to use it and to incorporate it into their lives. And if I'm lucky, it'll last more than 15 years and they'll pass it along to one of their kids, right? If I made it well. So things have that, you know, everything we have, it's all about meaning beyond utility. And that's really where things gather their significance. So, uh, you know, this cupboard that I showed you earlier, it's in my bedroom. Uh, and for me, it's a very meaningful thing, not only because I love the cupboard, but my mom who passed away in 2015 gave me this angel, even though I'm an atheist, she gave me this angel. And so it has meaning for me. <laughs> That box is on the front cover of my first book. The bowl was actually made by Kristen's daughter, uh, who I met when I first started teaching here. She's a wonderful uh, ceramicist. I love her work. And the photograph was taken by the daughter of the guy that taught me to make furniture. So all of these things together, which by themselves, when they were first acquired, really had no meaning. And they probably didn't have any utility either. But taken together in my room every day, they've become a part of my life and they now have meaning and purpose. And hope, you know, I hope that that's what all my work does. And for some reason I have these photographs, I don't know why, but uh, um, this is that cabinet which you can come see in the wood shop. I don't know why these are here. You get to see more stuff that I made, I guess. There's a tea cabinet I made recently a wall cabinet I made for uh, someone to store their sewing notions in. Um, if you wanna see what I'm up to regularly, you can check me out on Instagram, uh, MEK Woodworks. And as, since Kat mentioned it, I also have something called the Book of Robots that I'm working on, which is uh, robot drawings uh, that I do a lot of. And my first job ever was in a pizza place. And I was a pizza cook by the time I was 16. So I'm going to show you this, but I did not start during COVID. I've been doing this since my early 20s. I make bread all the time, too. <laughs> that's something I do a lot of. Oh, that's it. Yep. Thank you. Oh, this is, I'm trying to turn it on. Does it work? No. Thanks, Matt. OK. Um, our next instructor is somebody else. Okay, um, our next instructor is coming to us from Special Topics, specifically Glass, um, and introducing her is the Special Topics Assistant, Maggie Seinfeld. Hi everyone, I'm Maggie Seinfeld. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm the 2D mixed media photography special topics assistant. I'm here to introduce Lisa Westheimer. One second. You, you introduce her. Oh, you want me to introduce her? Yep. So Lisa Westheimer is a second career artist having had a 23 year career as a New York City building code and zoning consultant, consultant specializing in loft con conversions for artists and fire safety. Some of her clients include Jasper Johns, Roy Lichtenstein, Joel Shapiro, Julian Schnabel, 
Schnabel, and Kiki Smith. She received her master's in ceramics in 2008 from Montclair State University and is a self-taught at glass fusing. Her ceramic specialties are raku, luster, smoke, and pit firings. She's been teaching ceramics and glass at Montclair Art Museum for several years and has taken workshops and has taught Peters Valley for over many years. And she happily tries to burn down her studios many a times. Not special topics. Not special topics. She's trying to keep her job here, guys. <laughs> but she tries to do it all the time with her experimental work. So please welcome me, or please help me welcome Lisa West. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks everybody for tuning in and for being here. I'm Lisa Westheimer, and um, I'm going to tell you how I spent my pandemic vacation or my pandemic shutdown. Um, I usually spend the winters in Colorado and in 2020 on March 6th, I came home uh, to my studio in West Orange where we primarily live. And we were fast into being an epicenter. We lost friends within the, that week. Um, entire families in my neighborhood were sick and everything just shut down and all of my commitments, everything just evaporated. So in concept, here you have an artist with a fully stocked studio with no time commitments, right? It's like winning the lottery, wrong. I spent a lot of time pacing around my studio like a caged wild animal. I just had no creativity, I was so freaked out. So um, one of the things that I really love about my art making is that it's the intersection of science and creativity. So whenever creativity leaves the building, I throw myself into the science of my craft. So I tested glazes. I made clays, which I never did before. I did a lot of chemistry. I did a lot of math. And while all that was happening, things started percolating for me. So I had three prevailing feelings during this time. And I decided that I was going to create three separate series. And each series, I was going to learn something to take to the next one to take to the next one. So the, the prevailing feelings that I had were mourning of what I lost and who I lost, nostalgia, mostly for place where I couldn't go and was afraid that if something happened to me, I'd never get to again. And the third was rage over the situation. America was becoming something that I was not familiar with, I didn't recognize anymore, and I needed to deal with that. So the first thing I did was, and every artist probably has in their studio, a shelf that has bits and pieces of a project that someday before you die, you're gonna get to. But you don't wanna do it because it's either too complicated and you don't know how to do it, or it's too emotionally charged and you'd rather have root canal. So I decided that mourning was going to be me making reliquary boxes for my deceased pets. I don't have children, I have pets. And I decided that this project, since it was personal, was going to teach me skills that I wanna take into my other art. So I wanted to go into a more graphic novel style of expression. So that meant for me, making cartoonish paintings in glass of my pets and then putting text on the outside of the, the boxes. Usually I put all of the information on the inside of the box, put the lid on it and that's a mystery. You don't know what's inside. Well, this time it's all gonna be on the outside. So this is a video and I don't know how to make it go. So I'm just gonna, I, I have, don't worry. Okay. So what I did was, <laughs> I taught myself how to, um, these new skills where I work the cremains of each pet into the clay for each their box. And my rule was I had to use up all that clay and I had to have enough for the box I envisioned. And I, I couldn't put it into the next box. Another thing I challenged myself was if, if there was a flaw in the clay, after firing, I had to cold work it into the piece. I couldn't throw it away because it had cremains in it. And so, um, oh, here's the video. So I made these boxes. 
for each of my pets. Um, the last one contains three pets and they were from when I was a child. And um, I had to learn shrinkage rates because usually what I do is I make the clay box and then I cut the glass and I do the thing and I glue it in. This time I had the image first. So I had to learn percentages, how much that clay was gonna shrink so that the windows fit in it. And this one was the only one where the lid warped. And I just worked it into his personality because he was always flicking his ear at me. So I just made it look like that. And in this case, the crematorium had given me um, the paw print in foam and I had to learn how to work it into the box, uh, the lid of the box. So that brought me to the next series, which is nostalgia. And for me, it was nostalgia of place. There's four places in my life that I consider home that I go to in my mind when things are tough. One of them is Conifer, Colorado, where I spend my winter, my home base, West Orange, New Jersey, New York City, where I go every single week, and um, Truro, Massachusetts, where I go for part of my summers. So what I was going to do was make remembrances of them. So my husband's a fine art photographer, and over the years, he's taken aerial photography of mountain ranges in Colorado. And he's also done a collodion wet plate uh, photography of flora and fauna around our house in West Orange. So I had these images scanned and outputted into glass glazed decals, which I then fired onto glass. And then I mixed up clay, which contains the soil of each of these locations. And I made frames to go around these. Um, this one's called Colorado Fantasy Range. And it's um, from, from right to left, it's Maroon Bells, Capitol Peak and Snowmass Peak. And it's surrounded by a clay frame containing clay from conifer. This is in the Making Matters show. You can see this in the gallery. This is the front and this is the back. So the next two aren't finished. Um, my husband just welded stands for me and I'm gonna go around my property and find uh, rocks to be act as bases for these. But basically this is um, dragonfly. Uh, we live in a, in a historic community called Llewellyn Park and the name of our house is Woodlands Meadow Stables. It was built in 1885 for horses. And we have a, a, a meadow in front. And my favorite memories are in the summertime, squadrons of dragonflies hover about a foot over the field in formation like helicopters. And so I memorialize that memory with a clay frame that contains soil from my property. And this one is called Ferns and Crickets because we have a shade garden where the ferns are three and a half feet tall. And I love to stand in the middle of them because they come up to here on me. And in the summer they sway in the breeze and they rustle and you can hear the crickets singing. So for me, that's a great memory. I'm about to start Truro in New York City. Those, um, I was waiting for the decals to come back from the company. So all of that I brought into the final series, Rage. I, um, I was so upset at this point about what was happening in our country, how the COVID pandemic was being handled. And um, just like this, this undercurrent of violence that was brewing, it just was not my country anymore. And it was enraging me. And I was having trouble um, not falling into that same vat. So I was going to um, address two of the issues that I had the most trouble with. One was the way that healthcare workers endured the first wave of the pandemic, how many of them were um, putting their own lives at risk. They were having to isolate themselves from their families so as not to um, infect them. So they were pretty much alone without their support systems. They didn't have enough equipment in the beginning. They didn't even know what they were dealing with in the beginning. And so I decided that I was going to make Memorial Box and Thanksgiving for their service. So I found an article and if you go to my website, I have all the research, you can read their stories. These are healthcare workers that were interviewed during the first wave of the pandemic, and it tells their stories and where 
they are located in the country and what their professions are. So I made these graphic novel type images of them. And I created a box and there's text written all over it. And you can read what exactly what it says on my website. Basically inside the box in the base is text, there's statistics of how many people died and were infected and tested negative um, at a certain date. And these heart-shaped tokens have their names on the front and what their positions were and where they're from on the back. Each is, they're, they're ex-voto tokens in the Roman Catholic tradition and that each one represents a personal prayer of thanksgiving from me to them. And uh, here's a video of the box. And their stories are quite heartbreaking because the, the worst part for me, the most heartbreaking part for me of all was that these people stood in for the family members for the dying because the dying could not be with their families. And I think that's a lot to ask of a person. I mean, I have a friend, a next door neighbor who's an emergency room doctor. Her, her business partner commits suicide during this because it was just too tough for her. And so this box just represents my Thanksgiving for their service. And this was, this image is in case the video wouldn't run. Um, finally, we have 6120, A Sorrowful Mystery. This was the big kahuna for me. This was me putting my rage in a box and slamming the lid on it. And also for me, it's a documentary. I wanted to document two dates in our American history and make it into a durable good. So the first date is May 25th of 2020. Two things happened on that day. Number one, George Floyd was killed. Secondly, that's when Amy Cooper, who is a white dog walker in Central Park, walking her dog off the leash, was asked to kindly leash her dog by a bird watcher who is a black male person who called, and, and Amy, instead of leashing the dog, called the cops on him. And um, those two events sparked the Black Lives Matter protests throughout the country. And I was watching them unfold and how they were in getting more increasingly violent. And it was really worrisome to me. And then on June 1st of 2020, Donald Trump, after having the Washington DC protesters sprayed with rubber bullets and tear gas, walked to a church he doesn't go to to stand, hold up a Bible he doesn't read, for a photo opportunity. And I'm a sacred artist. Something snapped in me that day. And I was like, I've got to do something about this. So I took images and I made my little windows. And I told myself that if at any point this piece collapsed along the way or failed, it was done. I didn't have to keep going, but despite all odds, it worked. And um, here's a video of it. I have text written inside and out of it. I designed it loosely architecturally based upon the building in front of which Donald Trump stood to hold up that Bible. It had a mansard roof with slate tiles. And rather than putting slate tiles, I put ex voto tokens bearing the names of people of color who were killed unjustly by law enforcement in my research, which is on my website. And um, I put a bit of a manifesto inside. And the act for, of me to just put the lid on it was, cause I can't say I had any epiphanies at all, but at least I became a human being again after finishing it. And that's it, in case the video failed, I wanted to have that image. So anyway, I just want to thank you all so much. We made it through COVID, you guys, we did it. So you can um, go to my website, follow me on social media. I've got some blogs and I really thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay, our next instructor is coming to us from the Fiber Studio. Um, and here to introduce her is our Fiber's assistant, Celia Shaheen. Uh -huh, and I know how to do this now. For sure. Thanks, Talia. 
Um, yeah, so I'm gonna introduce Jean Brady, who is teaching um, block carving and printing on fabric this week in the Surface Studio. So Jean Brady is an artist and professor uh, emerita of fibers living near Nashville, Tennessee. Drawing, block carving, and printing imagery have always been central to her art, to her art, art making. Jean's textile work ranges from pieced and stitched wall art to sculptural garments and home goods. Her work has won numerous awards and been ex exhibited both nationally and internationally. So let's all give a warm welcome to Jean. Thank you everybody. And thanks for coming to watch and listen to all of us. Um, I am just to let you know that I'm actually an artist who has chosen to work in a medium a lot of people call craft, but I'm really truly an artist and there is a difference. <laughs> so um, what I'm giving you right now is just a little overview of some of the things that I've done. My undergraduate degree was in drawing and printmaking. And so a lot of drawing, was part of my upbringing and it was certainly a lot of part of my schooling and it's still a first love of mine. I actually started out as a painter and then fell in love with printmaking and block printing as well as lithography, which is very much a drawing process and then going into screen printing and all of that was done on paper. And I realized that for years I was trying to make paper act like fabric. And so I actually took a workshop at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts years ago and learned how to work on fabric and that was it. I quit my one job, went back to grad school and got a master's degree in surface and textile design. But my heart is always in the drawing, printing and painting. So even though I'm supposedly a craft artist. Most of my work is somewhat textile based in traditional textile print, which this is a repeat pattern screen print, where I draw out the design, put it in repeat so you cannot see where it begins and ends. So that's very much a traditional textile. With block printing, I'm really working with a lot of traditional sort of textile approaches but I'm really working from a place of a traditional printmaker and a block printer and that I love to show the carving process because block carving is a carving process. It's not a drawing process. And so to show the carving is really what's important to me. In this age of mass production and digital production, those of us who are hand printers have a big challenge in front of us because we, as you know, as an artist, the process is very slow where digital printing is very quick. So that's part of my orientation is I really wanna show the hand that goes into it. So my work is more wabi-sabi in a sense in that I like to show that somebody has made it by hand and it hasn't been digitally printed. And that is because we, are competing with the textile industry that is all mechanized now. And so I've made a conscious choice to actually keep my work a little more primitive, particularly in my block printing to really show the mark of the maker. And for me, the mark of the maker is really important. I think as a lot of us artists, that is a big challenge. And it's a big challenge because people, unless they're educated, to the aesthetics of handmade, they really don't understand the difference. And um, for me, the making is really what's most important. But a lot of my work, even though it's on fabric, is drawing and painting based. So a lot of my wall art and a lot of my sculptural garment pieces are all content based. So I really am an artist in that regard in that I, almost all my work that is not pure textile is all about content. It's just that working with fabric allows me more texture. It allows me more opportunity in terms of surface change. And it allows me to work with a variety of materials that can do more than just paper. 
So these images that I'm showing you now are actually screen printed either by hand or drawn out on a screen and then printed or hand drawn and block printed and painted. So a lot of these processes are very much kind of a painterly or a printmaker process, but I'm not doing it on paper, I'm doing it on fabric. So a lot of it's wax resist. A lot of it is working with direct objects like leaves and flowers. Much of my work is very organic and sort of nature-based. And then I cut and piece all those fabrics together to make one whole piece of cloth. A lot of it has to do with um, my influences, a lot of what I read. Um, Norman McLean, who wrote A River Runs Through It. This piece is really in heavily influenced by Norman McLean's A River Runs Through It. And for any of you who've seen the movie, it's a great movie, but the book is marvelous. The book really is amazing. And many authors, many writers are able to really put words together to create the most amazing visuals for me. And so what fabric allows me to do is to play with transparency, opacity, and texture. And if you think about authors, they're all about texture of words, poets and whatnot. And so one of the phrases in the book of A River Runs Through It is, he talks about the words beneath the water. And so what you're seeing in the detail here is the fact that I'm putting words on a sheer fabric that is overlaid over words on an opaque fabric. And there's not only an actual physical layering, there is um, a, a visual layering as well. And so I'm really trying to take a concept and create an, a visual analogy for it. So my work, most of my work is very much visual analogy. This piece is, um, <laughs> here's where whoop, the title just went out of my head but this piece was very much a content-based piece as well and it is all about the burdens that we carry with us throughout life from children up to adults and that we all have various experiences and many times we carry that baggage with us and so all this baggage is what's dragging behind. And so some of my garment pieces are very much related to the human experience. And so it needs to be in garment form rather than wall form. So that's the reason why those become garments. They're not necessarily wearable. They're really all about the content. This also is all about um, not only a concept, which I will not go into detail about, but it also deals with using fabrics, once again, it's layering with sheer fabrics over opaque fabrics. So it's very much like reading behind between the lines and we say things that we don't mean and really the meaning is somewhere else. It's hidden in between or underneath what we're saying. And so it's really once again trying to create a visual analogy for, for those kinds of concepts. But I also love playing with material and I also love playing with texture and text. So text is a huge part of my work. And I love text not only for adding that extra layer of meaning, but it, text is also shape and text is gesture. And so text has, it's very much like calligraphy. So in that sense, I feel almost like a calligrapher. So I'm really using the text, not only as shape, but also as meaning. But I also do textile work and I do wearables and I do home goods. And so I, I work between all of those because the content-based work takes a lot of thought, a lot of energy. The textile work is more of my, um, my sort of playtime as opposed to my serious time. And so this is the scarf that's up in the show in the gallery, and this is all hand block printed. So that's fabric laid out, blocks, hand carved, hand printed, and then those scarves I produce, I make the scarves. So I sew them. So I'm also a sewer. So I do a whole series of different types of scarves and those can be screen printed, those can be block printed, they can be hand drawn, but they're all done with a high quality permanent textile pigment that is non-toxic. And once you heat set it, it never goes away. It's really wonderful stuff and it keeps the fabric soft. 
And so this is some of my work between hand-drawn writing, text work, as well as block printing and screen printing. And that's me. Our next instructor is coming from the Fine Metal Studio. And here to introduce her is the Fine Metals assistant, Maddie Mayer. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Maddie Meyer. I'm the Fine Metal Studio assistant, and I'm here introducing Sarah Dormus, um, who is currently teaching the Brooches with Attitude workshop in the Fine Metal Studio. So Sarah is a jeweler and a sculptor who lives and works in Deer Isle, Maine. Um, she studied sculpture at Mass College of Art. Sarah's, Sarah worked at Metal Works in Wallingham, Massachusetts, and that is where her sculpture shrunk into the miniature. Um, she teaches workshops of all ages, but her biggest collaborations are with people aged 11 and younger. So please help me in introducing Sarah. So you know the punchline, I can just like stop now, but all right, so how do I, hello out there, how do I push the button? Is it uh, the arrow key? Okay, um, this is my house and I just left it yesterday and it's beautiful there now. I live up a mile long dirt driveway and you know why I bought that house? So I can hang my clothes naked. But now we have brown tail moth and I'll get into that. I won't get into that, but it's a problem. But if you see along the side, that's my studio right there. Uh, to the right hand side, my dog is making a cameo. And on in there, if by my car during COVID, I know everybody had a really hard time with COVID, but I teach elementary school right now because I get uh, insurance and summers off. And um, I thought I was going to gnaw my arm off when I first thought I'd do it, but it's really a lot of fun. But that this that last whole year, I didn't work because art is sort of superfluous, and they had to focus on math and English. So I kind of got to do whatever I wanted. I did slides for the kids and made like stop motion films. But I went to the dump and I found an ATV in the, I mean, an ATM in the dump. And I put it in my car and I would drive around to my friend's houses in the middle of the night. They'd wake up in the morning and there'd be an ATM in their driveway. And so it's resting places at my house. It doesn't work. But um, so this is another thing. I didn't have any silver. So I made this giant mambo um, COVID-19 COVID necklace. And if you turn it over, there's a, you unscrew it and there's soap in it. So you can use it too. You can wash your hands. Um, this piece, uh, I work with a lot of kids and a friend of mine teaches high school and her kids made these faces. And on the back, it says level-headed. And I love it because I am really not level-headed. Um, and it's a pin, a brooch. Um, and my students know a brooch and a pin, the difference, $250. Um, I did a show um, at, a, at a gallery where I got to pick the, my topic and I did um, a, a whole show on medals for our anxiety and our neuroses and so I'd ask everybody what's your neuroses and then I'd make a pin for it and this one is mine I am so afraid of incontinence and these are depends diapers um this one is fear of drowning because I live near the ocean um this is fear of heights don't look down this is fear of rabies and for my students that dog bone was cast with um Delft clay, and we'll be doing that. And on the back, it's etched with instru you know, information on rabies. And then I wanted to do some still lives, and I'm not a drawer or painter. So I made a still life on a, on a deli table. And Trump, I, I don't like him. Um, and this is a necklace. If you're a Mac user, you might not get it, but if you're a PC user, you will control alt delete. If only it were that simple. Um, this is a piece I made. This is the baby gate. And this is a, a piece that's uh, pat yourself. I work alone in my studio up there, up a mile long driveway. I'm naked, you know, so no one's there. So I have to pat myself on the back. So I made a ring to be able to do that. So it slides out, pat yourself on the back. I had a brief time when I worked on an ambulance and I love the word aphasia. 
it, because it feels good to say it in the phases when you can't say the right word. Like I was talking about this microphone and I said banana. And so this is a, a rooster who's an aphasic rooster because he's saying quack. And this is a piece, I like to use a lot of found objects. Um, I biked through Europe after college and this is called selfie nation because there's so many times people go cool places and all they do is take pictures. They don't even look at it. Um, I was in a show about reducing your carbon footprint. And this is, I do a lot of kinetic work and the cars spin around the outside and it's take the train, you know, don't drive. Um, and there's bearings inside and, um, so that's that one. Uh, this one is, I love this piece. It was with, at the Metal Museum in, in Memphis actually. And it's called Walk More. And on the other side, it says more. And it's a ring that you wind up. And when you take it off, it walks away. <laughs> this is a piece based on, um, it's uh, called uh, Trap by Patriotism. And it's a Victor mouse trap. And you know how they have that little picture of the mouse? Well, these are all, there's like a hundred mice there and they all have people that, names of people that were blacklisted and me, because I figure I would have been blacklisted. So they're mice and then the, uh, it's an American flag that's a painted mousetrap. Um, and then I, I got into this thing of 365 variations on a theme. So I had cast a whole bunch of these sort of three-dimensional rings and I made them into all different kinds of there were like a hundred of them. So some had like, uh, there were just tons. And these were just some of the ones I made. I work with kids and I've been starting to do a lot of wood carving. And these were some that were left over. I was in a show and I had a cold. So I made like 25 of these. They're all carved wood with little sterling like thing, things coming out of them. And you could buy the entire cold or you could buy a germ at a time. And um, then this one is, uh, it's, I was in a show in Boston called um, What My Mama Told Me. And my mama told me never run with a lollipop in your mouth because it'll poke your brain out if you fall. Well, this is a sucker. You open it up, you put your lollipop in, you put it in your mouth. And if you fall, it doesn't go down your throat uh, because you've got that thing in the back. It, it's hinged. Uh, this is called Cooper Light Happens as opposed to Shit Happens. And that's a petrified dinosaur poop. And when you make, when there's a little crank and there's a little uh, cam inside. And when you crank it, the bee flies all around the place. <laughs> this is, I did this whole series where I thought if I, um, I didn't want, I, I wasn't selling well. So I thought if I put it on the wall, I'll sell. So I made a whole bunch of pieces where um, you could take the pin off. That's uh, Charles Ponzi, and he has a sucker on. It's a, a, a Tootsie Roll pop. It's etched, and then there's a sterling silver Tootsie Roll pop, and it's based on the Ponzi scheme. And you know how it's a pyramid. And those are all those for my students. Those are the um, uh, decals that will be putting on on the steel enamel. Um, I grew up in, uh, well, I, didn't, I lived in Boston when I was in college and there was a priest, a pedophile priest problem. These are uh, self-flagellatory rings. So you put them on an appendage and then you crank them tighter and tighter and tighter. Hopefully you learn your lesson. And then when George Floyd, I did a whole series of of once I did a badge with George Floyd on it. And this one was hands up, don't shoot because it was at that time when that was and is still a problem. Um, and then this one is a piece, someone commissioned me to do a, uh, a jabot of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so those are little pieces of the American flag. Um, and that's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she was a bitch to cut out, let me tell you. And then sat her on the back. And, but um, the lady liked it, so there you go. And then one of the reasons I get to do what I do, I work with little kids. I only work three days a week as a teacher. And my partner's a civil engineer, uh, land surveyor, and they make the bank. 
So I just wanted to commemorate the person that lets me do what I do. Linda, thank you. Um, she hates it that I show this picture, but she's not here and you'll never meet her. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was really wonderful. Um, okay. Last up, we have um, our instructor from the ceramics studio, Ryan Decava, and introduce him is our ceramics instructor, Grace Kerr. And what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to close this and then I'm going to open it in case the last picture comes on first again. So because I'm very clever and that's what I'm going to do. And it didn't do it this time. <laughs> okay. There we go. Yep. Hello, everyone. I'm Grace, a ceramic assistant. Today, I'm here to introduce Ryan Takaba. Uh, Ryan originally from Hawaii and now lives and works in San Antonio, Texas. He's a material artist. His sculptures, um, tableaus, and installations are centered around a study of scientific reason and the power of belief, incorporating um, thematic materials like flowers, ash, wax, and water. He expects his work throughout the United States and has a uh, particip participant in residence at the European Ceramic Work Center, Netherlands, the pottery workshop in Jindazhen, China, and was awarded a residency through Blue Star contemporary to live and work at Berlin, Germany. Uh, let's welcome Ryan. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, Grace. How are you? I'm coming from San Antonio, like Grace said, and uh, I'm happy to be in some cooler climate. <laughs> but, uh, like Grace said, I'm originally from Hawaii and a lot of my work is a reflection on time and place as well as material properties and functionality. And so the current body of work that I've been producing uh, has been a major theme throughout most of my work. And then a lot of it came from traveling back and forth to Hawaii to visit my grandmother. So back in 2005, my grandfather passed away and what I would do is, is go back to visit my grandmother and she had a personal altar in her bedroom. And on that altar, there was some arrangement of flowers, candles, and some incense. So I took those ideas and tried to interpret it in a different way. So what you're looking at is a line of candles made out of cast porcelain. So they're individual units. And each individual unit is lit daily. And so the wax in the, in the form, the interior form, that candle would light, heat up the exterior and then slowly melt the, the outer layer of the wax, uh, revealing a black glaze. So my, in my grandmother's belief, she believed that as, the, as someone passes, their spirit wanders in the dark for 49 days. And so I was taking that idea of 49 units or 49 days, each day a piece was lit and the wax would reveal the, the underneath glaze. And so this, this was also about the idea of awake and, and forming awake. So sort of like the way water might move. And then this is the, it's a little hard to see, but that's a, a, a line of these candles. And, um, the next piece on that series was using incense and porcelain. So in this piece, it's a ladder uh, comprised of 49 incense sticks. And then one piece is lit daily. And the tension that would occur as the, as the piece was lit and then eventually broke, the heat would rise smoking the wall. And then eventually the ash would cascade down the ladder. Uh, this piece is based on the flower vase, and it's uh, made up of 49 
pieces that fit together like a puzzle. And so in this piece, I, I drew the form out in Rhino in a computer program and then cut it out in foam and then modeled a topography in clay and then cast each image. And so they would come apart daily. So I was thinking of what the image would look like in a topographical topographical view on the right. And then each day a piece was moved from the right to the left, forming a new composition or a new landscape moving from left to right. So again, I was thinking about like my grandmother's daily rituals of using objects. And so a lot of the work that I've been making has to do with either myself using it or through or interacting with it and documenting it through video. And then a detail of that piece. And then the, the final landscape. Uh, the next series uh, was a springboard from that. And I decided to take the, the materials on my grandmother's altar and transform the, the idea of the personal space into a more of expansive space. So in this installation, I enclosed the room and just with a small doorway. And so what you're looking at on the left is a helium balloon about 34 inches in diameter. And ash, incense ash was burnt and then sprinkled onto the balloon to weigh it down so that it would put it in equilibrium. And the, the cube on the far right is made out of rose petals, white rose petals, fresh rose petals, and then fixed to a wooden basswood frame. So in the beginning, it's just really heavy with moisture and, and water until the flowers dry. And the, the middle piece is a pyramid that is cast in wax, uh, wrapped, wrapped in candle wick. So it's sort of an evidence of time. So these three elements of the, the form uh, lifting or floating, and then the form flying and the form falling was, were sort of the themes in this body of work. And the ceiling is a drop ceiling made out of glassine paper. So what I liked about this is the, the viewer or myself or the person interacting with the piece becomes the fourth object or the fourth element in the work. So as you enter the space, your movement of air or the displacement of the air space caused by the movement of the body flutters the ceiling and then activates the installation. And so as the, the kite, the cube kite, um, dries, the, the flowers will twist the cube into a rhombus-like form. So I chose those three forms because I spent a, about three months in Berlin and the, the residency in Berlin was my time to explore living in a space, working in a space for, for a set amount of time. The balloon in Berlin has a, a lot of history with trying to get over the Berlin wall with helium balloons, hot air balloons. Uh, it's one of those balloon uh, like things that you see that people will take on tourist rides and stuff like that. So it became something of interest to me. And so I, I had this balloon floating in my space. And then the kite's history tracks back to China, about 500 AD. And it started with the, the cube as a, a form of aviation or the idea of flying a kite in the form of a cube that would eventually transition to a double rectangle, which is your glider, and then the, the double wing canvas plane. But these cube kites were made for plane and fighting. They, they oscillate and there's, oh, it's only tethered by a single point. And so this is uh, the balloon at rest and then a detail of the ash. And while, my, while I spent my time in Berlin, the I got to go to Munich to visit the Science Museum and the Science Museum has a lot of aviation objects and the history of aviation. So the parachute was the last object that I was trying to figure out and 
I decided to reference Leonardo da Vinci's design of the parachute, which was based on a pyramid structure that a lot of people didn't think it would fly, but, um, or I mean, the work. And uh, what, what happened was in 2000, uh, somebody tested it and it actually did work. So I decided to use that form as a starting point. It was tested in wax. And what you're seeing is it lit and dripping. And as my body uh, approaches the balloon, the draft of my body moves the balloon. It's floating. And at times as the ash bounces, uh, if the balloon bounces against the wall, the ash falls and then lifts the balloon up. And then eventually the equilibrium changes and the helium falls, makes the balloon fall. Uh, this image is the, the detail of the wax burning. And then the, the final image of the three objects in motion with myself. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, everyone. That concludes our presentations for tonight. So um, whether you were here on Zoom or in person, we thank you for being here this evening. Um, if you need anything from the office, please let one of our staff members know. Otherwise, enjoy your evening and your workshops. Thanks, everyone. Yay. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.